This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. The Illusion of a National Culture The Essential Identity of All Culture The Danger of the Collective Concept Comparative Psychology of Peoples Influence of the Social Impulse Individual and Mass Psychology Judgment about Foreign Peoples the picture of one's own nation as a wish concept, the symbol of the nation, the illusion of a national culture, culture's freedom from frontiers, capitalism as temporary result of social evolution, the rationalizing of capitalistic economy, the Americanizing of Europe, the influence of capitalistic economy on modern state policy, the form of the state of peculiar national endowments, the modern constitutional state, the nature of parties, the parliamentary machine, economic individualism and the capitalistic state, economic nationalism, political reconstructions of the present time. There is no culture of any sort of which it could be asserted that it arose altogether independently and without outside influences. It is true that we have long been accustomed to organize the so-called history of culture according to definite points of view, somewhat as a druggist puts up his stuff in little boxes, vials, and cartons, but one cannot maintain that we have gained much by this. While we were busy working out very thoroughly the inner contrast between different culture patterns, we lost the ability rightly to value the common features which lie at the foundation of every culture. We can no longer see the forest for the trees. Spengler's decline of the West was only a belated, though completely logical, result of this obsession. The surprising achievements of modern ethnology and sociology gave renewed keenness to our understanding of the striking similarity of the social and cultural development in different human groups and led to a revision of the traditional views. Wherever scientific research has undertaken the investigation of a past culture epoch, it has come upon the remains of still older co cultures or of blendings and transfers which plainly reveal the invigorating influence of earlier social patterns. We can't fall out of this world, as Grabe says. This utterance constantly reminds us of the essential and universal which unite all human beings with one another and which, in spite of all the peculiarities arising from differences in climate and external conditions of life, quite harmonize the inner equilibrium between the different human groups. We are all children of this earth and subject to the same laws of life, which find their most elementary expression in hunger and love. And because we are, by and large, of the same physiological species, because the natural environment in which we live acts on us to the same degree, even if the external conditions are not everywhere the same. Therefore, the intellectual and spiritual precipitates which the external surroundings produce in us are much more similar than people suspect. Everywhere man struggles for the preservation of his species and, within the species, for his personal existence. Everywhere the bases of his behavior are the same. The natural environment and the inborn impulses which have been transmitted to him by the unbroken chain of his ancestors and which operate in the unconscious of our minds give rise everywhere to the same primal forms of religious experience. The struggle for existence leads in all religions to definite forms of economic and political life which frequently display an astonishing similarity even when we are dealing with peoples of a different race who are widely separated from one another by continents and oceans. All this shows that our thinking and doing, because we all possess the same physiological properties and the same sensitivity to the influences of the environment, are subject to the same fundamental laws of life, in comparison with which all the differences of expression play quite a subordinate role. Usually we are dealing only with a difference in degree, which springs merely from more developed or more primitive cultural requirements. 
Since Hegel and others taught us to think in abstract general concepts, that manner of thinking has become the fashion. We have grown used to working with psychological quantities, and thus we arrive at the most far-reaching generalizations without most of us even suspecting that we have been made the victims of arbitrary assumptions from which we must ensue the most misleading conclusions. After Lazarus and Steinthal, following in the footsteps of Herbart, had, with all conceivable ingenuity, constructed the so-called comparative psychology of peoples, the drift in this direction went merrily onward and led us with compelling logic to the abstract idea of a mass, class, and race soul and similar ideas created by intellectual acrobatics, according to which one can think everything and nothing. Thus Dostoevsky became the type of the Slavic soul, as Goethe became the revealer of the German soul. The Englishman appears to us as the living embodiment of sober understanding to whom any sentimental consideration of things is denied the Frenchman as the representative of frivolous vainglory, and the Germans as a people of poets and thinkers. We get drunk on this tumult of words and are happy as kings when the language is enriched with a new verbal fetish. We speak in all sobriety of an individual people, yes, even of an individual state, by which one is by no means to understand men who belong to a certain people or are citizens of a certain state. No, one is dealing, in this case, with an entire people or an entire state, as if they were individuals with definite traits of character and peculiar psychic properties or intellectual qualities. Let us understand clearly what that means. In an abstract structure, like a state or people, that merely conveys to us a sociological concept is endowed with definite properties which are perceptible only in the individual and which applied to a generalization must irrevocably lead to the most monstrably deceptive conclusions. How such constructions come into being, Lazarus has shown us with complete clarity in the argument of his psychology of peoples. After he had quite unthinkably transferred the properties of the individual to entire peoples and nations, he explained profoundly that the separate man comes into the question at all merely as a representative of the collective intellect and only as such can be a transmitter of ideas. Following the thought process of Wilhelm von Humboldt, Lazarus and Steinthal relied chiefly upon the difference of languages, the organic structure of which they tried to deduce from the special intellectual type of each people. To this peculiar intellectual and spiritual endowment, they traced also the difference in the religious ideas of the peoples, their forms of government, their social institutions, and their ethical concepts, as ascribed to every nation a particular type of feeling and thought which it could voluntarily neither accept nor reject. Since then, we have learned that language as expression of the special intellectual and spiritual status of a people does not enter into the question at all, since there is no longer any people which has retained its primitive language or has not changed its language in the course of its history, as has already brought out. The same holds true for the different forms of government, social institutions, moral views, and religious systems. Despite this, men continued along the lines that had been opened up by Lazarus and Steinthal. Gustave Le Bon became the founder of mass psychology. Others devoured the psyche of the class, while the Gobineaus, Chamberlains, Woltmans, and Ginters luckily found the race soul. They all pursued the same method. They transferred the peculiar properties of the individual to nations, classes, and races and thought that they had thus transformed an abstract construct into a living organism. This is the same method by which man made his gods. He transferred his own character to the pale creature of his imagination, and then set it up as the master of his life. Who would doubt that the inventors of the various collective psychologies, who have constructed their schemes in the same way, will of necessity reach the same results? 
Every collective concept developed in this way becomes a Saturn, who in this case devours not his children, but his parents. When men began to work with the concept of mass psychology, they meant by it at first merely that man, when, when he is together with many others of his kind, and because of some stimulus is seized with the same excitement, is subject to a special emotion, which leads him under the circumstances to acts which he would not perform alone by himself. So far, so good. Without doubt, there are such moods, but here, too, we are always dealing with a mood of the individual, not with a mood of the mass as such. Emotions of this sort doubtless arise from the social impulse of man and merely show that this is an essential feature of his human experience. In this way arise moods of general sorrow and of general rejoicing and animation, just as indeed every profound psychic experience of the individual arises from the immediate influence of his social environment. A mass expression of human feeling, such as we can observe in demonstrations by rather large numbers of men, is impressive just because here the sum of the elementary force of all the individual emotions makes itself felt and so affects extraordinarily the state of mind of the individual. Moreover, similarities of feelings among individuals shows itself not only in association with great masses, but with other accompanying phenomena, which is merely to say that regardless of all the differences, there are present in human beings certain common basic instincts. Thus, enforced loneliness and enforced companionship induce in many individuals altogether similar emotions, which often even lead to the same behavior. The same thing is observed in many of the phenomena of sickness, in sexual excitement, and on a hundred other occasions. One can therefore speak only of an individual psychic or intellectual condition. For it is only in the individual that the psychological prerequisites for emotions of any sort or for mental impressions are present. They are not to be found in abstract entities like the state, nation, or mass. We can just as little conceive the occurrence of a thought without the functioning of the brain or of sense impression without the mediation of the nerves as we can of the digestive process without the appropriate organs. Just for this reason, every collective psychology lacks that firm basis on which alone any useful comparison could rest. But the adherents of these theories are undisturbed by such trifles and generalize merrily. What they bring forth is sometimes very cleverly constructed, but that is all. Membership in a particular class, nation, or race has for a long time not been decisive for the total thought and feeling of the individual. Just as little can the essential nature of a nation, race, or class be distilled from the manner of thought and fundamentals of character of individuals. Every larger or smaller social structure includes persons of every conceivable trait of character intellectual endowment, and effective behavior instincts in which every shade of human thought and feeling find expression. Among the people who belong to such a group, there exists usually a vague feeling of relationship, which is not in any way inborn, but is acquired, and is of little significance in judging the group as a whole. The same is also true of physical and intellectual similarities that have their origin in the conditions of the environment. In every instance, the special characteristics of the individual throughout his entire development stand out much more sharply than do certain common features which have arisen in particular human groups in the course of time. Indeed, Schopenhauer had already recognized this when he said, Besides, individuality greatly outweighs nationality and in any given human being deserves a thousand times more consideration. National character, since it has to do with the crowd, will never be anything fairly to boast about. It is rather that, that human limitation, perversity and baseness appear in every country in a different form, and we call this the national character. Disgusted by one of them, we praise another until this, too, has earned our disgust. Every nation speaks scornfully of every other, and they are all right. What Schopenhauer says about here about nationality 
and the national character can be applied without change to every other collective concept. The properties which the psychologists of the crowd ascribe to or invent from their collective structures very seldom correspond to reality. They are always the result of personal wish concepts and are therefore to be valued only as fanciful structures. The race of a nation whose qualities the race or folk psychologist tries to represent is always like the picture which he has made of it in advance. According to the affection or aversion which he feels for it at a given moment, will this race or nation seem brilliant, chivalrous, faithful, idealistic, honorable, or intellectually inferior, calculating, faithless, materialistic, and treacherous? Let one compare the different judgments which were passed during world, the World War by members of every nation upon other nations and one will be unable to entertain any illusions about the true significance of such estimates. The impression would still be more devastating if one should bring into comparison also the estimates of earlier periods and contrast them with the later, say, the hymn of the French romantic Victor Hugo about German peoples or the ode of the English poet Thomas Campbell to the Germans and as contrasting pieces to these effusions of respectable contemporaries in both countries concerning these same Germans. Though just here we are speaking of Englishmen and Frenchmen, the Germans would provide no better examples. Let one read the hot-headed judgments of German race theoreticians about the alleged inferiority of the Britons and degeneracy of the French, and one understands at once the maxim of Nietzsche. To associate with no man who had a share in the deceitful race fraud. How greatly opinion about foreign nations is affected by altered circumstances and momentary moods is shown by the productions of two French authors whom Carl Lahn has presented in his valuable and frank little book, Frenchman. Thus, Frederick Constant de Rougemont was able to say this for the Germans. The German comes into the world to a spiritual life. He lacks the light, simple cheerfulness of the Frenchman. His soul is rich, his temperament sensitive and profound. He is tireless at work, persistent in undertaking. No people has a higher moral code. Among none do men attain a greater age. While the inhabitants of other countries make it their boast that they are Frenchmen, Englishmen, or Spaniards, the German embraces all mankind with his unprejudiced love. Just because of its location in the center of Europe, the German nation seems to be at once the heart and the dominating reason of mankind. Let us compare these utterances with the estimate of these same Germans by the Dominican Father Didon in his book Le Aleman. I have never encountered among present-day Germans, not even at that age when men are most accessible to chivalrous ideas, any sublime emotion that reached beyond the horizon of the German fatherland. The frontier shuts the Germans in body and soul. Self-interest is their highest law. Their greatest statesmen are merely clever utilitarians. Their self-seeking policy, which is more avid of profit than glory, has never felt the slightest misgivings about the country which unresistingly and blindly accepts its oracles. Germans make allies for themselves, but no friends. Those whom they bind to themselves are impelled either by interest or fear. They are thinking of the difficulties of the future. How can men be free from fear when they are at the mercy of a power that is not inspired by justice and when the dominance of self-interest is unlimited? Germany's preponderance in Europe means universal militarism, a rule of terror, violence, and selfishness. Times beyond number, I have tried to discover among them any kind of sympathy for other nations. I have never been so fortunate as to find it. The two judgments utterly destroy one another, but without doubt, each in its own way, they have influenced public opinion in France. There is, of course, a certain explanation for the sweeping contradiction that which we find here. The two estimates come from two different men. One was uttered before, and the other after, the Franco-German War of 1870 and 71. 
Then, in the great period of shams, which hot-headed boobies called the steel bath of the folk rejuvenation, people were quicker at the trigger in passing judgment and had learned besides to modify a judgment to fit the circumstances. Thus, the Popolo d'Italia, the organ of the later dictator Mussolini, laid down the following admirable estimate of the Romanians before they had entered into the war and declared themselves upon the side of the Allies. Let us finally quit calling the Romanians our sister nation. They are no Romans even if they adorn themselves with that noble name. They are a mixture of those barbarian, primitive peoples who were subjugated by the Romans with Slavs, Pechenegis, Chazars, Avars, Tatars, Mongols, Huns, Turks, and Greeks. And one can easily imagine what sort of ragbag that produced. The Romanian is still today a barbarian, an inferior individual who, to the universal scornful amusement of the Frenchmen and the Parisians, likes to fish in muddy waters when there is no danger that he will get himself into trouble. He showed this clearly in 1913. Hardly, however, had the Romanians entered the war on the side of the Allies when the same Journal of Mussolini's wrote of them, the Romanians have now proved gloriously that they are the worthy sons of ancient Romans from whom, like ourselves, they are descended. They are therefore our next of kin who now, with that courage and determination which distinguishes them, have joined in the struggle of the Latin and Slavic races against the German. In other words, the struggle of freedom, culture, and right against Prussian tyranny, arbitrary rule, barbarism, and selfishness. And just as the Romanians showed in 1877 what they were capable of at the side of our brave Russian allies against the Turkish barbarism, so will they now also throw their sharp sword into the scale against the Austrian-Hungarian-German barbarism and unculture and bring these to their knees. Of course, nothing else was to be expected of a people which has the honor to belong to the Latin race which once ruled the world. It would be a grateful task to carefully gather and contrast with one another similar estimates which were made of the various nations during the World War. Such a collection would furnish better evidence of the worldliness of our time than the finest commentaries of our historians. If the judgment of the so-called race or folk psychologists about foreign nations is, as a rule, unjust, one-sided, and artificially constructed, then the continued glorification of a man's own nation to the derogation of all others affects one as utterly silly and childish, provided one still has any feelings for such things. Let us think of a man who misses no opportunity to parade himself as the very paragon of wisdom, talent, and virtue, and while thus burning incense to himself, disparages all others and treats them as inferiors. One would certainly take him for a vain booby or an imbecile and treat him accordingly. But when our own nation is concerned, we take up with the wildest delusions and are not at all ashamed to deck ourselves in all the virtues and to regard the others as peoples of the second rank, as if it were by our own merit that we came into the world as Germans, Frenchmen, or Chinese. Even discriminating minds are subject to this weakness, and the Scottish philosopher Hume knew that he what he was saying when he declared, When our nation gets into war with another, we abhor the hostile nation with all our heart and call it cruel, faithless, unjust, and violent. We ourselves, however, and our allies we hold to be honorable, reasonable, and gentle. We designate our treacheries as cleverness, our cruelties become for us necessities. In sort, our faults seem to us small and insignificant, and not infrequently we call them by the name of that virtue which is most like them. Every collective psychology suffers from these defects and is compelled by the logic of its own assumptions to proclaim empty wishes as concrete facts. By this it arrives automatically at conclusions of the sort for which self-deception smooths the way. It is especially unfortunate to speak of a national culture in which the special mind or the special soul of each people allegedly finds expression. The belief in the national culture soul rests upon the same illusion as the historical mission of Boswet, Fichte, 
Hegel, and, uh, and their numerous successors. Culture, as such, is never national, because it always extends beyond the political frame of the state structure and is confined by no national frontier. A brief glance at the various fields of cultural life will easily confirm this. We will disregard any artificial distinction between civilization and culture for the reasons earlier advanced. Our survey will extend rather over all the fields in which man's conscious attack upon the crude natural course of events has found expression. From the material structure of economic life to the most highly developed forms of intellectual creativeness and artistic activity. For what Carol Capek has so beautifully clothed in words holds good also for us. Every human activity, which has as its purpose the perfecting, the enlightening, and the ordering of our life, is cultural. There is no yawning cleft between culture and everything else. I would not assert that the roar of motors is the music of the present, but the roar of motors is one of the voices and the polyphony of cultural life. Just as the heavenly notes of the violin, or the words of the actor, or the shouting on the field of sport are voices in this polyphony. Culture is not a section or a fragment of life, it is its sum and center. It would be a vain undertaking to prove the national origin or content of the capitalistic economic system under which we live. Modern capitalism has carried the monopolizing of the means of productions and of social wealth in the interest of small minorities to an unbelievable length, and in doing so has delivered the great mass of the working population over to all the cruelties of wage slavery. But it is neither the result of any national undertakings, nor has it ideologically the slightest element in common with such undertakings. It is true that the supporters of capitalistic economy under certain circumstances are favorable to the national undertakings, but their favor is always a matter of calculation. For the national interests to which they commit themselves are always really their own interests. No economic order of the past has so openly and ruthlessly sacrificed all so-called national principles to the rapacity of small minorities in a society as the capitalistic order. The shaping of capitalistic economic methods progressed in all countries with such astounding uniformity that one can understand why the economists and economic politicians constantly harp up the determinism of this development and see in every manifestation of the capitalist system the inevitable result of iron economic laws whose effects are stronger than the will of its human agents. In fact, capitalism has shown in every country which it has thus far captured the same phenomena, the same effects upon the collective life of men without distinction of race or nation. If here and there small differences are noticeable, this is not the result of peculiar national characteristics, but of the various degrees of capitalistic economic development. This shows itself today very clearly in the development of the great capitalistic industries in Europe, and especially in Germany. It is not long since everywhere strong opinions were based upon the fabulous development of American industry and its methods of work. Men sought to find in these methods the inevitable operation of a peculiar American mentality, which could never be harmonized with the temperament of Europeans and especially of Germans. Who today would have the courage, in view of the latest results of our collective economic life, to defend this assertion? As untenable as it is arrogant, the famous or much better the notorious rationalizing of industry with the help of the Taylor system and Ford's continuous operation has within the last few years made greater advances in Germany than in any other country. We have long understood that Taylorism and Fordism are not at all specific products of the American mentality, but obvious phenomena of the capitalistic economic order. As such, the sentimental German promoter is just as receptive to their advantages as the most hard-boiled Yankee, whose purely materialistic attitude we could formerly not sufficiently condemn. 
The fact that these methods first arose in America is no proof that they are based upon the American mentality and are to be esteemed as peculiar national characteristics. Their methods did not come even to Ford and Taylor as a special gift from heaven. These men, too, had their predecessors and pacemakers who arose out of capitalistic industry and were certainly not destined for this role by a peculiar national endowment. Continuous operation, stopwatch, and scientific management, as they have christened the minute calculation of every muscular movement in work, have arisen gradually out of capitalistically controlled industry and have been fostered by it. It is of slight significance for the general character of mechanical production, whether this or that machine find its application in Germany or in America. The same is true of the methods of work which grow out of the development of the modern technique. The endeavor to make production yield the greatest results with the smallest expenditure of power is closely bound up with modern machine production and with capitalistic economy in general. The constantly accelerated harnessing of natural forces and their technical employment the constant refinement of mechanical apparatus, the industrializing of agriculture, and the growing specialization of labor bear witness to this. That the latest manifestations of industrial capitalism were noticeable in America earlier than elsewhere has not the slightest relation to national influences. In a country which has been so unusually favored by nature and which industrial development set out at such a gigantic pace, the extremes of capitalistic economic life necessarily mature earlier and stand out in sharper forms. Fred Taylor, who found his starting point in these fantastic industrial processes and whose mind was restrained by no ancient traditions, recognized with a sure instinct the utterly unlimited possibilities of this development. Constant increase of the productive capacity in industry was the slogan of the time, and led to continuous further improvements of mechanical apparatus. Under these circumstances, was it such an unheard of phenomenon that a man hit upon the idea of adjusting the machine of flesh and bones to the rhythm of the machine of steel and iron? From the Taylor system to the traveling belt was only a step. Ford was the beneficiary of Taylor, and his much prated genius consists only in his having developed Taylor's methods farther for his own purposes and having adapted them to the new conditions of mass production. These methods gradually spread all over Europe. In Germany, rationalization within a few years brought about a complete transformation of industry as a whole. Today, French industry bears its brand. The other countries follow at a little distance, must follow if their economy is not to fall to the rear. Even in Bolshevist Russia, they follow the same path and speak of a socializing of the Taylor system without considering that they thus seal the fate of socialism, which the Russian Revolution was to realize. What is true of this latest phase of capitalistic development is true of the development of capitalism in general. It has begun everywhere with the same attendant phenomena. Neither the national boundaries of the various states nor national and religious traditions were able to check its advance. In India, China, Japan, we observe today the same phenomena which were presented to us by early capitalism in Europe, except that the progress of development is today everywhere much more rapid. In all modern industrial countries, the struggle for raw materials and for markets, which is so indicative of the nature of capitalistic economy, leads to the same results and puts its stamp upon the foreign policy of the capitalistic states. These manifestations proceed everywhere with a strang uniformity and in almost the same shapes. Nothing, however, nothing at all in this indicates that forces are here in operation that are traceable to the peculiar national endowment of one or another people. The transition from private to monopoly capitalism, which we can observe today in every industrial country, goes on everywhere. 
Everywhere it is shown that the capitalistic world has entered upon a new phase of its development, which yet more openly expresses its true character. Capitalism today breaks through all frontiers of the so-called national economic fields and works ever more unequivocally for a condition of organized world economy. Capital, which formerly felt itself bound up with certain national interests, develops into world capital and is concerned with building up the exploitation of all mankind on uniform principles. We see today how in place of earlier national economic groups, there are crystallizing out ever more distinctly three great economic entities, America, Europe, and Asia. There is no reason why the development in this direction should not keep on so long as the capitalistic system can hold out at all. Free contract was the great slogan of the political economists who saw in the free play of forces the necessary operation of an iron economic law. Today, those already antiquated forms are more and more yielding the field to the strategy of collective capitalistic organizations which undertake to eliminate contract entirely by setting up national and international trusts in order to achieve uniform control of prices. If formerly the mutual competition of private owners in an industry and trade took care that entrepreneurs and merchants should not be able to raise their prices quite too high, today the promoters of the great economic cartels are in a position easily to suppress all private competition and in the thoroughness of their control prescribe prices to consumers. Corporations like the Internationale Rostallgemeinschaft and a hundred others show clearly the course of this development. Together with the ancient private capitalism vanishes also its catchword of laissez-faire, to make way for the economic dictatorship of modern collective capitalism. No, our present economic system has not a single national vein in its body, just as little as the economic systems of the past and economics in general. What is said here of modern industrial capitalism is true also of trade and bank capital. Its administrators and beneficiaries feel themselves everywhere safe in the saddle. They conspire to bring on wage wars and organize revolutions. They provide modern politics with the necessary slogans with which to conceal behind the veil of misleading ideas the cruel and insatiable greed of small minorities. By means of a venal and thoroughly mendacious press, they modify and shape public opinion. And with cold cynicism, disregard every mandate of humanity and social morality. In a word, they make personal profit the starting point of every discussion and are always ready to sacrifice to this Moloch the weal and the woe of mankind. Whenever innocent souls catch the scent of deep political reasons or of national hatred, there is open to them no recourse except to the conspiracies instigated by the pirates of finance. They exploit everything, political and economic rivalries, national hostilities, diplomatic traditions, and religious antagonisms. In all the wars of the last quarter century, one finds the hand of high finance. The conquest of Egypt and the Transvaal, the annexation of Tripoli, the occupation of Morocco, the partition of Persia, the carnage in Manchuria, and the international bloodbath in China on the occasion of the Boxer Uprising, the Japanese wars, everywhere one stumbles upon the big banks the hundreds of thousands of men that the war will cost, what does that matter to finance? The mind of the financer is concerned with columns of figures which balance. The rest is none of his affair. He does not even possess imagination enough to include human lives in his calculation. Capitalism is everywhere the same in its objectives, likewise in the selection of its means. Its devastating effects on the intellectual and emotional life of men are also everywhere the same. Its practical operation in all parts of the earth leads to the same results and imprints on men a peculiar stamp which has not been known before. 
If one follows these phenomena with a watchful eye, one cannot avoid the conclusion that our modern economic system is the symbol of a definite epoch, and in no way the result of special national exertions. The forces of every nation have had a part in bringing about this condition. If one wishes to really grasp its inner nature, then one must dive into the intellectual and material assumptions of the capitalistic epoch. But it would be a vain task to try and judge the economic foundations of this and all past social epochs from a so-called national point of view. This is just the reason why the so-called economic nationalism, of which there is so much talk today, and which has cast its spell over even outspoken socialists, is so hopelessly high-flown. From the fact that the old national economic entities are today being more and more completely crushed by the world economy of the international trusts and cartels, men have rather prematurely drawn the conclusion that all economy is to be transformed and reconstructed on the basis of the special endowments and capabilities resident in each people because of their national peculiarities. Thus, one regards operations in the coal industry and its different branches and the proceeding of fiber stuffs as occupations which are best suited to the national industrial instincts of Englishmen, while one says of the Germans that they are best fitted for the potash industry, lithography, and chemical trade and optics. Thus, it is believed that to each people can be assigned a special industrial activity, which best fits his national endowment, and that in this way, a reorganization of the whole economic life can be arrived at. In reality, these ideas are merely a new addition of similar lines of thought which once played an important role in the works of the old English economists. Then, too, it was thought necessary to establish that nature herself had destined certain peoples for industry and others for agriculture. This illusion long ago went into the discard, and its latest ideological recoinage will be accorded no better end. Men as individuals can be subjected to industrial specialization. Whole peoples and nations never. This and similar lines of thought suffer from the same defect that is found in the foundation of every collective concept. A man may very well, because of a certain inborn characteristics and capabilities, belong among the chemists, the farmers, the painters, or the philosophers. But a people as a whole never permits itself to be subjected to an abstract assumption because every one of its members exhibits peculiar inclinations and requirements which become apparent in the rich manifoldness of their undertakings. This very many-sidedness in which natural endowments, capacities, and inclinations mutually supplement one another constitutes the genuine essence of every community. Who overlooks this has no understanding whatever of the organic structure of the community. Been said here about the economic side of social culture applies also to the political forms of social life. These also can be judged and valued only as products of definite epochs, never as typical manifestations of any kind of national ideology whatever. It would be a futile undertaking to examine all past forms of the state in light of their national character and content. In this field also, we have to do with a social development which gradually penetrated to every part of the European culture circle, and just for this reason was connected with no specific national norm. Even the most decided supporters of national thought cannot deny that the transition from the state with subjects to the national constitutional state occurred in all Europe under the same social assumptions and often in quite similar forms. The absolute monarchy, which almost everywhere in Europe preceded the present constitutional state, was originally just as intimately interwoven with the ancient feudal economy as was later 
the parliamentary system with the economic order of private capital, and as the latter was confined by no national boundaries, so also the parliamentary form of government served not merely a particular nation, but all the so-called culture nations as the political frame for their social activities. Even in the manifestations of decay of the parliamentary system, which one can observe everywhere today, reveal themselves in every country in similar forms. However much Mussolini might insist that modern fascism was a purely Italian product which could not be imitated by any other nation, the history of the last ten years has already shown how arrogant and baseless that claim was. Fascism also, regardless of its exaggerated nationalistic ideology, is merely a product of the spirit of our time, born of a definite situation and nourished by it. The general economic, political, and social status which arose in consequence of the World War left, led in all countries to similar efforts, which is merely evidence that even the most extreme nationalism is, in the final view, to be regarded as a tendency of t the time which develops under specific social conditions and which in no way embodies the special national spirit of a particular people. The modern politician is, in every country with a parliamentary government, determined by the same norm and pursues everywhere the same aims. He is a type which is found in every modern state and is shaped by the peculiarities of his profession. Attached to his party, to whose will he gives expression, he is always striving to make its opinion the dominant one and to defend its special interests as general interests. If he arises slightly above the average intellectual level of the usual party leader, he knows quite well that the alleged will of his party is merely the will of a small minority, which gives direction to the party and determines its practical activity. Always to hold the party firmly in hand, and so to guide its adherents that each believes he is guided by his own will is one of the characteristic manifestations of the modern party system. The nature of political parties upon which every parliamentary government rests is in every country the same. Everywhere the party is distinguished from other human organizations by its endeavor to attain power. It has the conquest of the state inscribed on its banner. Its whole organizational structure imitates that of the state. And just as the government is constantly guided by reasons of the state, the party is guided always by considerations of its special reasons of the party. An action or an idea is for its adherence good or bad just or unjust, not because it agrees with the personal judgment and convictions of the individual, but because it is advantageous or disadvantageous to the undertakings of the party, furthers its ends, or is a hindrance to them. And here the voluntary discipline which the party imposes upon its adherence proves itself as a rule more effective than the menace of law, because servitude on principle is always deeper rooted than that which is imposed on men by external force. So long as a party has not attained the public influence for which it strives, it stands in opposition to the existing government. But an opposition is such a necessary institution for the parliamentary system of government that if it did not exist, one would have to invent it, as Napoleon III once cynically remarked. If the party becomes stronger so that the heads of state must reckon with its influence, they make to it all sorts of concessions and under some conditions invite its leaders into the government. But the very existence of political parties and their influence in public life contradicts most strikingly the illusion of an alleged national consciousness, for it shows only too clearly how hopelessly divided and shattered the artificial structure of the nation is. Now, as regards parliamentary government as such, there are indeed in the individual countries certain differences, which, however, are to be regarded merely as formal deviations 
and not at all as essential differences. Everywhere the parliamentary machine operates by the same methods and with the same routine. The discussions in the legislative bodies serve, in a measure, merely as theatrical exhibitions for the public and have not at all the purpose of convincing opponents or weakening their convictions. The position of the so-called representatives of the people in the vote upon various questions which come up for debate is determined and advanced in the separate party caucuses, and not even the eloquence of a Demosthenes would be able to change it. If the Parliament would merely confine itself to voting and abstain from all public discussion of the separate proposals, the results would not differ by a hair. The oratorical exhibitions are by and large merely a necessary adjunct to keep up appearances. This is the same in France as it is in England and America, and it would be a waste of time to try and discover special national features in the practical procedure of the separate parliaments. The whole development in Europe up to the modern constitutional state has proceeded everywhere in more or less similar form for the same reasons, since conditions underlay it which were effectively not merely for a particular nation, but forced themselves with the same irresistible logic upon all the peoples of the continent, however much the supporters of the old regime might struggle against them. Perhaps temporary differences can be discovered, for the great transformation did not take place in all countries at the same time, but its manifestations were everywhere alike and were fostered by the same causes. Furthermore, this is proved by the rise and spread of the so-called mercantile theories, which exerted such a decisive influence on the internal and external policies of the absolutist states of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. These theories found famous advocates in every country in Europe, in France, Bodin, Montcretain, de Watteville, Sully, Malone, Forbonnet, and others. In England, Rayleigh, Munn, Child, Temple, and so on. In Italy, Gailani, Genovese, and their successors. In Spain, Usteriz and Uloya. In Holland, Hugo Grotius and Peter de Groot. In Austria and Germany, Becker, Herneck, Seckendorf, Eusti, Sismlik. Sonnenfels, and many others. Here, too, we are dealing with a general intellectual drift which arose from the social status of Europe. The more the absolutist state operated in the different countries as an unsurmountable obstacle to any further social development, the more clearly the destructiveness of its political economic tendencies were revealed, and the more unequivocally apparent became of course in time, the striving for political reconstruction and new understandings of economic theory. The insane extravagance of the courts in the midst of starving peoples, the shameless prodigality of the favorites and the mistresses, the collapse of agriculture because of the feudal privileges and a monstrous system of taxation, the threat of state bankruptcy, the unrest of the peasants who were hardly regarded as human by the privileged orders, the destruction of all moral ties, and the heartless indifference in those striking words of Pompadour, which have achieved such pitiable frame. Upper nu le deluge. All this could but prepare the way for the overthrow of the old regime and lead to new views of life. Whether this occurred from within, as in Holland, England, or France, or was affected from without, as in Germany, Austria, and Poland, is of little importance. So there arose critics of absolutism and social reformers like Montesquieu, Rousseau, Voltaire, Diderot, and many others, who had been preceded in Holland and England by thinkers with similar ideas. The school of the physiocrats also, which made war upon mercantilism, regarded agriculture as the real source of wealth of the people and sought the liberation of economy in general from all state ordinances and regulations, was produced by the same causes. The famous saying of the Gournay, laissez-faire, laissez-alter, 
which was later to serve the Manchester School as a motto, had originally a quite different meaning. It was an outcry of the human spirit against the iron compulsion of state guardianship, which threatened to smother every demonstration of social life. It was becoming more and more impossible to breathe freely, and men were beginning to yearn for sunlight and air. The ideas of Quesne, Mirabeau, Baudot, and de la Riviere, Turgot, and others, with surprising promptness, found militant supporters in Germany, Austria, Poland, Sweden, Spain, and America. Under their influence and that of David Hume, Adam Smith developed his new theory and became the founder of the classical economics, which soon spread through their countries, just as did the critique of socialism, which followed those on its heels. Here, too, we are dealing with phenomena of the time, which were born of the general social conditions of a definite period, which gradually led to a reconstruction of the state and a renewal of the economic life. But St. Simon already recognized that even this form of political life is not the last when he said, The parliamentary and constitutional system, which seems to so many to be the last miracle of the human intellect, is merely a transitional dominion between feudalism, on whose ruins we are living, and whose fetters we have not yet completely shaken off, and a higher order of affairs. The more deeply we look into the current structure of political and economic life, the more clearly we recognize that its forms have arisen from the general course of social development and therefore cannot be measured by national principles. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.